Well, after my video on the Sapphire Project, I wanted to do a follow-up and talk about twin Tesla magnifier vacuum arc discharge versus the Sapphire approach because I made the claim that vacuum arc discharge is going to do a better job at producing fusion and energy and uh, remediation possibly and other effects. And to understand that, you can first look at this arc discharge or discharge chart. And there are several different regimes. To begin with, at really low voltage, uh, if you have an arc path, it behaves like a capacitor. And then once you get saturation, you get a dark discharge regime. And then when you get breakdown and you're exciting the gas, you get glow discharge. And in some cases, you can have glow discharge followed by dark discharge as the energy falls off at the same time in the same tube. And you see this with DC tubes. It's not going to be visible when you're running an alternating current. And then finally, you have arc discharge. That's where you get the lightning. And if you look at the chart, you can see the high voltage peaks at the arc discharge and falls. So you only have a small window where you get the maximum voltage at the arc and then the voltage falls off. And this, the regime depends on your fill gas, your voltage and your pressure primarily. And what we call the passion curve which starts high and goes slow and then dips back up. And the vacuum arc discharge regime is at the low pressure end, and which is also where you're going to get your highest voltage. But you also get high pressure arcs like in a room where you build up static electricity and you hit a, a doorknob and it, and it arcs, or you hit touch a friend. And that also depends on distance. Um, the breakdown in dry air is about 30 kilovolts per centimeter, while in moist air, in the higher humidity, it can drop to around 8 kilovolts per centimeter. So distance is important. And then also the electrode material and shape. If you have a round electrode, like a sphere or a toroid, you can increase the breakout voltage where the arc happens. And that's why you see toroids used on Tesla coils. Uh, but if you want to regulate it at a certain voltage, then you may want a sharper point in an electrode. But the problem with a vacuum arc tube is, like a light bulb, is that you can round off your electrodes as the gas hits them. So to maintain sharpness, you might use a trick like a hollow cathode tube. And so those are being experimented with with vacuum arc discharge, and that's something that I might experiment with. So the type of metal and the shape of the electrode and even things like having thorated tungsten can change the, the energy at which you get your arcs, your voltage. And then you have the different types of pulses. You can have alternating current, which I like to use. You can have pulse DC and you can have continuous DC. And each one brings about different types of characteristics. But running continuous DC generally requires the most energy. And so if you're trying to get a high efficiency apparatus in terms of the amount of light, then running in pulses is going to do that. So the fun stuff really happens when you're at the transition between the glow discharge regime and the arc discharge because that's when the voltage is highest. And in my case I was trying to produce x-rays, try to get as many x-rays as I want. So I had to be at high voltage and also short pulses because as the pulses get longer the voltage drops and I get fewer x-rays. And then we had to have a minimum energy per pulse, and in our apparatus, which is about 30 centimeters, we've measured it to be 15 to 20 
uh, millijoules needed per pulse. Now the current transformer was interfering with the measurement, the one that we were using to make the measurement. <laughs> so 10 millijoules or so may be sufficient to achieve breakout, but we couldn't really find the number without making the measurement and the measurement interfered with the actual breakout number. Well, that, that aside, the other thing is cycles per second. If you're running a transformer on directly off your main voltage at 50 or 60 hertz, then because you have two cycles if you're running AC, then you get 100 arcs, 100 or 120 arcs per second. And if you want to get more, you have to run a transformer that runs at higher frequency. So say if you run at 20 kilohertz, you could get 40,000 arcs per second. Uh, but you also have to make sure that you have the minimum number of energy per half cycle in order for those arcs to happen. Otherwise, you just sit there and nothing happens. And that's a problem we had with some of the power supplies we were trying to develop when we were doing experiments uh, 20 years ago. So what I wanted to try was the Tesla magnifier because with the ferrite core transformers we weren't getting them to resonate properly. So I figured I'd step back and do air core or maybe have a core that's filled with transformer oil. That way it's easier to set up. And what we found was when I was doing the research is that we could get much higher frequencies of 100 kilohertz or more. And in part because the way a Tesla coil is designed, you have a primary and then a secondary, and these are matched so that they resonate and can achieve high voltage because you get a, a large winding ratio. But the problem with the normal Tesla coil setup is that the resonance of the secondary coil is inhibited by it being coupled to the primary. So what Tesla realized in order to achieve really high voltages, he needed to have a third coil, one that wasn't grounded and was free to resonate on its own. So I'll show a little picture of a regular Tesla magnifier. Now what I wanted to do was to actually have two Tesla magnifiers so that the third coils, which are perpendicular to the second one, so they're not as strongly magnetically coupled. And then, so they, when one discharged, it would charge the other, which would ring back and charge the first one, causing arcs in the path in between. And so if you do that, you can set up a twin Tesla magnifier where you have different resonant frequencies. And in the case of what I wanted to use is have a 3, 4, 11 ratio where the primary coil has a frequency of 3, a factor of 3, compared to a factor of 4 for the secondary and a factor of 11 for the third coil. And because it's ringing every half wave, I could get seven arcs for every cycle of the primary power supply. And that way I can multiply it into the hundreds of thousands. And so that was a design that I put together and I have a lot of the parts already. I need, I need to have some glasswork done in order to join everything together and then I'd be ready to do some experiments. So at some point when I get in a situation where I'm a little more settled and can set up a lab, I plan to do that. And I think that it's this sort of apparatus that's going to give you the best x-ray production because the x-rays are primarily not produced by gas collisions, but when the gas hits the anode, you get Bremsstrahlung and that's where the x-ray is optimized. And also, in this case, that's where the fusion happens too. That when the gas molecules hit the electrode, the electrode gets saturated with the gas, and then other 
gas molecules on the next start come along and cause collisions. Now this sort of fusion is well known. They will take tritium and saturate titanium, scanium, or palladium with tritium because those metals are good absorbers of, of hydrogen atoms. And then you collide it with deuterium and you can get deuterium-tritium fusion. And there's fusion devices used in the, the oil field when they want to do analysis of oil wells to see where, where they have hydrocarbons underground. So this technology isn't anything new, and so we know how, how it works. But I'm trying to see how efficient I can make it, both for x-ray production and for fusion. And I wanted to, as I've discussed in other videos, J.J. Thompson found that if he started with hydrogen, he got deuterium, he created tritium for the first time, that anyone, well, he's first to actually measure that he had created tritium, and then also producing helium. So we can increase our understanding of how light element fusion comes about in this type of apparatus where you have plasma arc discharge. And then he also produced neon, and which appeared to be coming from collisions between oxygen and helium, and so that's something else I'd like to try to reproduce. And he also found that hydrogen kept showing up in his arc discharge tubes, no matter what he did to try to make it clean of hydrogen. So I'd like to do some experiments where I start with a perfectly clean brand new tube that doesn't have any hydrogen in it and see if hydrogen starts to show up spontaneously. Um, it's one of those things we need to verify the science because a lot of people like to deny and say, no, that can't happen, just, just ignore it. Well, we can't ignore it because if it can happen, it changes everything. So that's what I plan to do. And there are some cautions. Uh, you can get a lot of stray arcs around a high frequency Tesla coil setup. So it's necessary to make sure that you have ins insulated everything and don't have stray grounds that where you can lose energy, especially if you're trying to measure energy efficiency. If you think you may be over unity and doing an experiment like that, you want to make sure that you don't have uncontrolled ground pass. And then, of course, safety is a pri priority. For this experiment that I'm doing, radiation safety is huge. We were getting dose rates of 500 Rankins per hour at three meters. Uh, and so this, this is a deadly dose if you get too close for too long. So it's necessary to have lead shielding around it and to keep anyone who's doing, who's observing this behind a lead curtain and make sure that nobody else is getting exposed. And of course you have your electrical safety. You're dealing with arcs that could be deadly. Uh, so this is dangerous, so don't do this at home unless you have proper guidance with uh, both electrical and radiation safety. And then another thing to keep in mind is you should put a Faraday cage around the whole thing because you're going to put off a lot of radio waves. If you're resonating in the hundreds of thousands of, of cycles per second, then you're in the very high frequency range. So you can be interfering with local communications. You could interfere with communications with um, planes, for example. There's a story, one day me and my partner were finishing up and going to lunch and turned off the experiment and we went outside and there was a white van with about 15 different antennas circling around our neighborhood. And so we suspect that we were broadcasting and they were looking for us. And But luckily that was about the time when we were wrapping up our experiment. So uh, 
but just build a Faraday cage around it so you don't have that sort of problem. <laughs> anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, I do hope to do this someday when I get a little more settled and try to do some x-ray and fusion experiments and maybe see if some odd behavior happens that could be very important. And so, like the video, share it with your physicist friends, subscribe for more, and I have books for sale on my physics research if you want to learn more about that. And so, thanks for watching.